uh, I wanted to kind of explain, to share, because it's always nice to share across fields. How do others see things? To share how my field works with IBS and what you guys, especially as practitioners and doctors, can do to help your clients even more regain control. So really to start, I'm a medical hypnotherapist. I'm also, I am the director of Mind-Based Healing. Uh, Mind-Based Healing provides leadership in the development and application of mind-based practices, especially hypnotherapy and NLP, to effectively treat the psychosocial factors behind chronic disease. Mm. And I have a private practice um, behind the Brand Support Plaza. And as well, like most of you, also with a lot of clients that are remote. So today I wanted to talk about irritable bowel syndrome because there's a very large population that has it, or at least has the criteria for IBS. There are different researchers that say 10, possibly up to 20% of the population, both in the US and in the UK. I refer a lot to the UK because most of my studies in IBS and most of the research in IBS with hypnotherapy was actually done in the UK. And because I think IBS is a perfect example of how we can collaborate. Because with IBS, there are both biological as well as psychosocial factors, both in the onset and exacerbation of IBS. And by collaborating, we could have the, the best outcome. So how does my field work with IBS? To begin, I wanted to actually give myself a little credibility. Just because sometimes I'm like, oh, hypnosis, it's a that watch thing, you know, we think about you know, stage hypnosis or our main movies about influencing or it must be something about positive affirmations, you know, or getting your eyes to do certain things. <laughs> hypnosis for IBS is actually one of the most researched hypnotherapy applications in medicine. We had our first controlled trial of hypnotherapy for the treatment of severe refractory. So they didn't give us the normal IBS. It was always the ones who do not respond to any pharmacology. And the first um, controlled trial was in 1984, so 35 years ago. Already in this first trial, there it was compared to psychotherapy with placebo. And our, in this trial, psychotherapy with placebo had small but significant improvements in abdominal pain, abdominal distension, and general well-being, but no changes in bowel habit. However, the hypnotherapy did have significant improvements across all features. And what was really good was that the three-month follow-up period, there was no recorded relapse. Since then, they've also done five-year studies and it has continued to show that even after five years, 81% of those that did hypnotherapy did not have a relapse. And those that did had the tools to help themselves regulate again. So that was 35 years ago. And then I pulled this one up just because it was a review after 30 years of having research using hypnotherapy for IBS. We had 35 different studies published in scientific journals. And without exception, they have reported significant positive impact of hypnotherapy on bowel symptoms of the GI disorders. And half of those were RCTs. And those RCTs as well showing that the outcomes were superior than the control groups. To the point that because a lot of this research was done in the UK, we do have, we began here in the US in the late 90s in North Carolina. The NIC, which is the National Institute of Health Care and Excellence in the UK, kind of like our FDA, but kind of sort of, in their guidelines for irritable bowel syndrome, actually recommends hypnotherapy in the case of those with IBS that do not respond to pharmacology treatments. So we get to play with the worst cases. Mm -hmm. And it actually has been shown that the worst cases of IBS are the ones that respond best to hypnotherapy. We imagine that it's because they're motivated mm -hmm. to do the work, to listen to the recordings, and to do the tools and the practices. 
So I wanted to share this just because it's a great way to kind of see what is each of our fields see. In my field, we consider IBS to have four probable causes. It's like what's the most common thing that comes into our office. Usually what has happened is someone has gotten really, really, really sick or they had a stomach flu and that knocked their GI system out for, you know, for a prolonged period and that has then become the new normal. The second, not very common, but sometimes is they make this massive change in their diet and it, their GI system does not respond too well in it. One of the cases, of course, we see a lot is stress. And I'll go into this in a little more in detail. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if you're stressed, if you're stressed, it's like even myself this morning going, okay, do I have the information? Do I have my stomach? Would I haven't had dinner, as you can see. Because I know what will happen to dinner if I try to eat and then come up here. I know this is going to shut down because all my energy is in sympathetic, right? There is no energy here to do a ho hum let me digest. Well, if your clients are having breakfast on the go in the car as they're going to work, and then they have this, and then they have to hurry up, and at lunch they have to make phone calls, whether, all of this stuff is knocking their GI system out. And then they wonder why mentally it has anything to do with their IBS. And then emotional triggers. And in this one, there has been research which shows that people with IBS have four times more history of trauma and abuse. Also, clients come in with bereavement, with trauma, and right after the trauma, they have the IBS going on. Mm -hmm. And then family history, but not genetically. What we tend to see is that families that tend to focus on stomach problems tend to then have kids that focus on stomach problems. And I'll give you a personal example. My mom gave me her tummy blankie when I was little. And when my tummy hurt, I got to use her tummy blankie. Mm -hmm. And so even in my family, we were very focused on how's the tummy doing with this, how's the tummy doing with that. So the more you focus on something, the more you notice it, right? If we can only focus on seven bits of information and one of them happens to be right there, we notice at all times what's happening in our belly. However, those are only the initiating triggers. What causes the continuous exacerbations, the increased hypervigilance, and the sensitivities is stress. This is actually, I actually took, this is a notes from one of my clients for them, like for them. This I always show to my clients for them to understand. When they are stressing out, when they have a pain, when they start stressing that what is this, they, they're saying it's IBS, I doubt it's IBS, it's right where all my major organs are, this is probably, they haven't figured out what it is. They're sending themselves into sympathetic. And when they send themselves into sympathetic, all their energy, and then I have clients I'm like, and then my hands tingle. And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> all your energy is in your arms and your legs and your frontal lobe, which is saying, oh my God, 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 oh my God. And as you do that, your body goes, freak out, freak out, freak out. And so I explain to them why going into sympathetic and worry actually freezes the stomach. The stomach just stops or the stomach dumps, right? We're in fight or flight, let me just dump this so I can run faster. Versus when they take themselves into parasympathetic or they actually eat in parasympathetic, they're able to digest and heal. Kind of like what our parents, I don't know about you, but my mom would always like, we can't go into the swimming pool until a half hour after you. Yeah. yeah, well as adults we should apply that as well. You can't run to a building and then run to this meeting and do it and become <laughs> right after eating. So, stressing about it causes further exacerbations. Why? Because it triggers further sympathetic. It triggers more alert. Oh my gosh, what is that? What is that weird feeling? Oh, it's lower. <gasps> Maybe this is something else. This isn't the IBS. I think this is something else, right? And so we're going into that. When that happens, people tend to start overusing. They do that roller coaster. Oh, I'm going to try this because someone told me. 
oh no, okay, now I'm going to try this. They never leave enough time to see if things really work. And so they're on this roller coaster and their GI tract is even worse because it can't even adapt to all these new elements and materials and liquid diets and da-da-da that it's happening all this stuff. And of course, like kind of what I said, we have these wonderful hormones called neuropeptides that communicate to every cell and every organ in our body what we're thinking. So if we're thinking, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is going to get really tight, right? Probably can't breathe, et cetera, et cetera. So these actually make it worse. And why I really wanted to talk about this is I, because I have clients that come in and, and we talk about how they're doing, you know, we really talk about how they're feeling about it. They tell me about being in bed at night, feeling this stabbing, and thinking, this is this is this has got to be serious, you know, and believing something is broken and they just haven't found it yet. They're telling me it's IBS because they haven't figured it out, right? And so they're getting themselves even worse. And then accumulate, they're not sleeping, which then makes it even harder for them to cope with it. Mm -hmm. So what part does hypnotherapy play in working through IBS? Hypnotherapy works in three areas. The, that first study of 1984 was mainly focused on giving suggestions and metaphors while in hypnosis to alter symptoms, to regulate motility. There's actually studies just on regulating motility through hypnosis, to just have that movement nice and regular instead of stopping or <coughs> letting go so quickly. Also helping suggestions to improve sleep. But as well, we start addressing the, we address the anxiety, the stress triggers, trauma, both if there was something that happened right before the IBS began, or in childhood that's just getting re-triggered over and over, and any underlying emotions that might be stressed. And as well, we give them tons of tools for them to activate the relaxation response. And so we'll have them actually do tools in which they kind of bring the hypnosis relaxation. I had one client, he's a big CEO, he's like, oh, the salespeople were just, on me and I was just mm -hmm, totally not taking it in because they, they start getting all these different tools that they can use to keep their body more in parasympathetic than constantly in sympathetic. So what can you do to help the client regain control? Well, I wanted to read something. Um, there was a survey, this again in the UK, of patients with IBS. And it turns out that 21% of those diagnosed with IBS think it might develop into a cancer. If you're in bed at night and you think that pain or the stomach being this big is probably because of cancer and they just haven't found it, right? Or 40%, so almost one out of two, think it might become colitis. And then all the stories about colitis and losing your colon and da 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 or that's going to get worse with age. So here's a 30-year-old. She's in bed. She feels awful. Or a 16-year-old. I work with several young people who think, if this is how it is now, they freak themselves out. How am I going to go to college? How am I going to get a job if this is going on? They believe it to be like, it's supposed to be like this, but worse and constant, right? And all of that is making it worse. I mean, I, in my experience, I see that a lot of patients are just having an anxiety disorder as well. So the time that it's like perseverance of thoughts of like, you know, hypochondriac thoughts and something more she's going to happen. So. I mean, think about it as well. If they're already people that are tend to be more anxious, and you have a stabbing pain right where all your vital organs are, it is not like having a stabbing pain in your pinky. Right? It's like if you lose your pinky, oh well, you know, it'll be a little harder to type. <coughs> but it's this area. So it just makes it, and it's very painful, and no one's really telling you what's going on. It's making it much worse. So a huge component to help them regain control is to reduce that stress. 
and to address the fears and the beliefs head on. There are so many times, and it's so difficult for me to speak to them about this part because the authority are you guys. So these would be suggestions. Inform them about IBS. They believe their body's broken, their gut must be broken, that it is not physically damaging, that it is functional, that they might be feeling a pain and the pain is caused by a function that's actually possible. Inform them that yes, the first thing you did was test for life-threatening diseases that might mimic the same symptoms because they believe that hasn't been done. A lot of my clients come in and they're like, I don't think they tested for cancer. I think this is cancer. I think this is colitis. Let them know these are the things that we've tested for. We can take those off the table. Let them know it doesn't have to get worse. The IBS can spike and then you know you're fine for years before again some triggering factor happens or not. This is another one. Because they have IBS, they have a belief I am sicker or unhealthier. I'm more sick, let's say, than the average Joe. They think that because they have this now, it's just going to get other stuff. It's like, oh, this is how it's going to start. And that, again, is going to get them into, oh my gosh, I have hyper even worse. Now I have this thing. What if this thing is something with my lymph nodes? Because what? And again, they start thinking, IBS is only the beginning. Let them know that there's a big part of the population. You know, whenever I have a kid come in, I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, I had it really bad. You know, I tell them stories and I tell, so that they're like, oh, more people do this. Well, yeah, 10 to 20% of the population, right? And talk about those gingerbread men, you know, the parasympathetic and sympathetic, because it allows them to go, oh, hang on a second, right? If I get in bed and I get to just start imagining all these things, I can actually cause things, right? So actually, I assume the bed with recording so they don't have the time to think. You get to relax. Very important. When someone is in your office and is totally anxious and you are an authority figure, anything you tell them goes straight in. And any words you tell them go straight in. So I wanted to actually read something my clients are always telling me. Yeah, but they said, Listen to these words as if you came in with something that you have no idea what it is. And a doctor, a practitioner says, you don't yet know what's causing this. We're going to run some more tests. When you receive that, you're like, a whole array of possibilities come through your head. Now, this is my NLP translation, I'm not a practitioner, so I know you can't say these exact words, but listen to this possibility as you're thinking about your clients being totally hypnotic in your office. We've already tested for life-threatening diseases. We can safely say you do not have cancer, appendicitis, or colitis, etc. The symptoms you are experiencing will not develop into one of those. We've already tested for that. You're good. Now we're looking at the nuances. Very different testing for something. We're looking at the nuances of what might be happening that's causing you discomfort. It's now a question of regular functioning and finding the right strategies to get your body to function regularly again. Very different, right? Then we're going to keep testing. We don't know yet. Right? And the third piece, and this I find in my office a lot, is when you're speaking to them about suggestions, what to do, what nutrients to take, what diets, what else, speak to them very non judgmentally. Because what happens is I have clients come in and they have their Western doctors and they have their naturopaths, where they have their acupuncturists, or nutritionists, or functional medicine, and they don't tell the other 
what they're doing because they're afraid that, you know, and they have the experience that they are just, well, he just doesn't know, right? So what do they do? They don't tell you. And so then what happens is you don't know what your client is taking. You don't know if they're taking painkillers that might give them even more constipation or they're taking, you know, bee sting, blah, 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 blah. You know, you don't know what they're taking. And if they're taking all sorts of weird things that they found online or, right, or special case cereal with a lot of milk because that's what the commercial told them, you don't know because they won't share if they feel they have to protect themselves or they have to protect you. So a little personal story. When I was 15, I changed schools and also countries. And my gut went ballistic. I had stomach pain every morning, extremely intense during the day, still pretty bad for more than three months. Went to the doctor, and it was so intense, he couldn't touch me, he thought I had appendicitis. Um, they did a whole bunch of tests, and finally they came back and they concluded, because as he was talking to me, he thought, oh, you just changed schools and country. And he sent me home with no tools, and a little humiliated. And I believed him when he told me, and this was like 10th grade, I was, you know, I used to be an A plus student, and all of a sudden I'm in a different country, different language, and I was failing everything, you know, and he told me, lighten up, you know, you're driving your body crazy, it's not that important, the test, you know, your body's receiving, this is life or death, really, and so I believed him. Um, so now, I rarely notice my stomach. The big section when, you know, sometimes when I do something like this, um, <laughs> when I'm talking about IBS to people who probably know about IBS more so than I do. And so today my stomach was just like, ah, ee, ah give me a little hellos. Um, but I know it's going to settle down, you know, and I know in a day or two it'll be fine. You know, it's going to give me a couple hiccups here and there and it'll be fine. I'm not worried about it. Do you do an online thing for people or? Yes, both. Great. Yeah, I have half of my clients here and half from right. um, other places. Awesome. So they, they, they can, can they do it all online? Then? Yes, they, yeah, yeah. Do, I do, yeah, video conferences. Is there usually, like, a, do you usually have people sign up for a certain number of sessions or is it? I usually recommend with something like IBS at least 10 sessions so that we can address all elements. I start with giving them relaxation and actually letting them visualize how food moves very consistently and how their wastebasket fills and they don't need to go until the wastebasket gives them the message that is totally filled. So I give them all these different visualizations so they begin to notice that their mind influences their symptoms and then we start doing the work of addressing the stresses and the triggers and everything. And, and then could you just talk just a little bit about your the rest of your practice so we don't aren't left with because I know you do other stuff so could you just yeah um, I began specializing in multiple sclerosis I wanted to take something and see just how much we can affect uh, an autoimmune disorder using the mind um, I had started with allergies and those are great we, we can affect those quite quickly in half an hour MS is much more complicated of course. Um, and so I've, I've worked quite a few years, almost exclusively with MS for about three years, and then began to you know, work with, i worked with cancer, um, I work a lot with IBS, with colitis, I actually got trained uh, for the IBS protocols from the UK because there wasn't really much here in the US for trainings. So I contacted professors there at the College of Hypnosis like, I'll pay you instead of me flying over there and you'll teach me direct. Yeah, and so they said yes. So, um, yeah, so I work with um, any, any chronic diseases. I help them. I actually do in hypnosis, we go and speak to the disease, which is wonderful because all of a sudden the disease, instead of being this, this thing that's very scary, is, you know, um, Sometimes it's an old lady who just wants to stay in the spa. You know, it's just like, make it old lady just sitting in the spa. She doesn't want to get out. That's her disease. And you know, and so it's the subconscious. <laughs> that would be constipation. That would be. 
and so the body, the subconscious actually kind of uh, develops a story for them to understand what their body's reacting to. And then once we know what are those triggers, then in the next sessions we can work on those directly. And what are some of the modalities that you use? Did you mention NLP? Yes. So I use, um, I use some hypnosis for the suggestions, hypnotherapy and regression therapy to actually go in and kind of do gestalt in hypnosis to talk to the disease or talk to a symptom that's coming up or talk to a stress to see where it's coming from. Um, and then I use NLP a lot for belief change. And also, there's tons of NLP techniques for anxiety. Slowing down your thoughts, uh, not having your mother anymore being, you know, your inner critic, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I've yeah. seen really great, remarkable, fast change with NLP. Yes. Really NLP is, is the technique for allergies is NLP technique. And for PTSD, is also NLP. Yeah. 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 That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.